Okay, welcome to the first lecture where we have some content. This is about ancient Egypt. And what you're looking at is the mask of Tutankhamun. And I'm sure you knew who he was just by looking at him, but you might not know why he's so famous. Um, it's not because he was an important king. He wasn't particularly. He was just lucky enough to not get robbed. He was a king during the New Kingdom. And during that time, the pharaohs have figured out that, hey, maybe we shouldn't make pyramids, which are basically like big flashing signs that say, rob me. So they started burying themselves in a place called the Valley of the Kings. And how they would make their tombs is they would dig them um, into the rock and then carve the tomb out of the rock. So they basically made caves. They were perfectly square, though. And then they would cover up the entrance to the tomb later on. And a long time ago, maybe a thousand years ago, someone had tried to rob the tomb next to Tutankhamun's and had moved a bunch of stones in the way. And in 1922, um, Howard Carter had moved some of the stones out of the way and found it. Um, so that was the reason why he's so famous is because unlike every other tomb, his wasn't robbed. And the types of things that were in his tomb uh, were extremely impressive. But since he was only Pharaoh for about um, eight or nine years, it's hard to imagine what the Pharaohs who were Pharaohs like for decades would have had in their tombs. Uh, so that's why he's so famous. His tomb wasn't robbed. Um, but this is just a small taste of what you would see if one of the more important pharaohs um, had found, one of their tombs had been found untouched. So his name uh, translates to the living image of Amun. Uh, and that's usually called the Horus name. The pharaohs have many names. And we'll talk about Amun a little bit later on. So ancient Egypt, like everything in our class, is in Africa. And it's funny that I have to say this, but um, in the 19th century, uh, a lot of European historians tried to make the argument that Egyptians were, and I'm putting up the air quotes, white, um, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and that was part of what I was talking about in the previous lecture, uh, about this kind of scientific racism where they were trying to prove uh, that whites were somehow superior. Um, that's not true, obviously. Egypt is in Africa, so we'll be talking about Egypt um, both as a culture that influenced uh, cultures around the Mediterranean, uh, but also how it was influenced by Africans and how it influenced other Africans. And we're going to see a little bit of um, overlap between the way that um, Egyptians thought about the world and the way they made their art and some of the other African cultures we're going to look at. So I'll try to concentrate on those types of things. If I was teaching in Western art class, I would concentrate more on the influence of Western art on Western art. So here we are again. Egypt is right up here in Northeast Africa. So the gift of the Nile, the reason why I call that slide this is because um, Egypt, going back to very ancient times, about 3000 BC, which is the beginning of the period that we're going to start in, um, was a desert, except for the floodplain of the Nile. So all life in cities are based around the Nile and its annual flooding cycles. And when the Nile floods, um, in the floodplain, there's left a soil that is possible to grow crops in and to have cattle. Um, so it's, it's a soil that creates life. Uh, so they call that Kemet, the black land. And Kemet is the name um, that the ancient Egyptians called their land. Uh, and then Desret is the red land. That means the wilderness to the east and very far to the west, um, going all the way into Libya, that is desert. So a lot of African cultures, and we're especially going to see this in West Africa, um, kind of look at, it's a cosmology of sorts, a way of organizing the world, uh, both the physical world and the spiritual world. And they look at organized areas where there's towns or cities or villages um, as 
you know, something that is civilization, basically. Uh, and then they look at the outside areas um, that aren't organized. They call that, that's wilderness uh, and disorganized. They can see power as coming from the organized areas, from the cities and towns, uh, but also uh, there's a possibility to get power or gain power within um, the wilderness areas. So we're going to see that repeating in a lot of the other African cultures that we look at. So another way that the ancient Egyptians organized their land is Upper and Lower Egypt. And it's kind of confusing when you see it on a map uh, because Upper Egypt is low, it's on the bottom, and then Lower Egypt is on the top. Uh, and that's because the Nile River runs from the highlands uh, all the way in, from Kenya um, down in elevation until it reaches the Mediterranean where it's at sea level. Uh, so the lower designates the lowland in the north, and the upper is the highland in the south. Uh, and going back to the dynastic period, the ancient Egyptian pharaohs considered themselves to have united two separate kingdoms, upper and lower Egypt, into what eventually would become the Egyptian empire. Um, so this uniting of these two warring factions was one of the um, kind of justifications for the power of the pharaoh. So this picture from Google Earth shows you that Egypt is still that way today. Uh, they have a dam, which I'll talk about later on, that controls the flooding cycles, uh, but it's still the same concept. You have areas where there's life, the Kemet, the black land, uh, and then wilderness on both sides. Uh, and we'll talk about later on about how the, the desert, the Saharan desert is expanding. So we don't get into a whole lot of detail with the religion of the Egyptians because this is an Egyptian art class, uh, but this just to give you an overview so we can understand some of the art that we're looking at. Um, first thing to look at is it's polytheistic, and that just literally means multiple gods, and that's most of the cultures we're going to look at. We'll look at some cultures that have taken on Islam or Christianity, uh, but a lot of the cultures that we're going to look at are going to be polytheistic or animistic, um, and that's basically the same thing. Uh, animistic more is towards nature gods, where polytheistic, maybe they could see transcendent gods, meaning gods separate from the earth. Um, as far as with the Egyptians, you know, it's hard to say which if it's animistic or, or um, transcendent. So they influence human lives and ordered the universe. Uh, they're often portrayed in animal and human form. And, you know, sometimes the same God will be portrayed as an animal um, another time it would be portrayed as a human with an animal head. Uh, this is Horus. Um, so a lot of the gods were local at one time, so they'd be worshipped in one particular town and kind of be the sponsor of sorts for that town. Um, and Horus is one of them, began as a local god. But once the pharaoh associated himself with Horus and the protection of Horus, uh, he became a national god. So there's a pantheon and... Um, if you download the lecture online, you can click on this. It's not super important to know, but if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can check it out. And one thing you'll see in Egypt and in most of the cultures that we're going to look at, um, other than just the kind of like the most traditional cultures, uh, is syncretism. Um, and that means incorporating deities from various cultures. And it will be also be incorporating ideas. Uh, so most religions... Um, most kind of like politics and philosophy, uh, they're gathered by taking ideas from the cultures that are around you and changing them or repurposing them or co-opting them uh, and using them again. And this is especially true with imagery uh, because those of you artists know that um, there's a lot of technique, uh, materials that goes along with creating imagery. So changing imagery is quite a bit di more difficult than changing, say, thoughts or, or philosophies. Um, so as a result, we'll often see the same images, but repurposed in a different way. So you don't have to know all of this. This is a lot on the slide, and, and you can make fun of me for having the papyrus background if you want. Um, this is just to give you an idea of the span of Egyptian history, and we're not going to cover all of these areas, only two of them, actually. So pre dynastic period is from about 5450 to 3100 BC. By this time, uh, ancient Egyptians have been farming for quite a while. 
uh, but they didn't create this big polity that we call Egypt, so a big united government of Lower and Upper Egypt. Uh, the, and the art from that period, it's not particularly interesting. It's a like, like a lot of different art, so we're not even going to cover it. The early dynastic period, we will see one thing from that. Uh, starts from about 3100 till 2649 um, BC. And as the slide says, all the dates before 664 are approximate. That's because the Egyptian calendar didn't originally have leap years. Uh, so over time, um, the calendar got really off. And, you know, <laughs> adding a thousand years and it's several years off and definitely not in the right season. Uh, so as a result, we're not really sure about the years. But once they got to the New Kingdom, uh, they had changed their calendar and added leap years. Uh, so those dates are a little bit better. Um, so uh, the dynasties one and two, and according to Egyptian historians, Upper and Lower Egypt was united. So this was something that even thousands of years later, Egyptian historians saw as being important. So when Egypt was united, as roughly the borders of modern Egypt, it was called kingdom. So you can see there's the old kingdom, the middle kingdom, and the new kingdom in red. Um, so the old kingdom is uh, pretty long lasting, about 500 years. And that's when we're gonna look at the great pyramids and the Sphinx. And then in between the kingdoms, uh, when Egypt was either split uh, with local dynasties ruling different parts of Egypt, or uh, in the third intermediate period, when it had split and then been taken over by neighboring empires. Um, we call those intermediate periods. So they still have dynasty numbers for those, uh, but sometimes there'll be multiple dynasties running simultaneously. Then the Middle Kingdom, uh, which is 291 years, which uh, for this time span isn't a lot, <laughs> but um, in the time span of ancient Egypt, you know, it's not too important, so we're not really going to talk about that. Uh, we will talk about the New Kingdom. And the New Kingdom is the height of the Egyptian Empire, but it's also kind of the last gasp of the Egyptian Empire. And this time period goes all the way down to the Persian kings. Uh, at that time, Persia was a, the, the greatest world empire. Um, and after 323 BC, it was taken over by Alexander the Great, who was Macedonian, Greek. And um, the pharaohs that ruled were actually Greek. Uh, so Alexander the Great's um, general, his name was Ptolemy, and he was appointed the governor, and he just started to take on the art um, and the iconography uh, of the pharaoh. So he was portrayed by Egyptian artists as an Egyptian king. So his family ruled uh, until the end of Egypt. Um, all of the kings were called Ptolemy, so Ptolemy the first, second, third, and all of the queens were called Cleopatra. And if you're thinking of Cleopatra in your head, the one that you're thinking of is the last queen of Egypt uh, and the, would have been the last monarch of any kind, uh, and that's Cleopatra the seventh. Um, so with her, uh, this culture basically stopped. Uh, but we're talking about a culture, I'm going to show you something from about 3100 BC, and it's going to look very similar to the way that Cleopatra had herself portrayed. Um, so an amazing time span that's um, almost impossible to conceive of. So think about it, like we have some similarities, there's going to be a lot of changes, but we're going to see a continuous culture for 3000 years. What happened 3000 years ago? That was 1000 BC. Uh, so the only culture in the world that lasted where we have historical evidence of it being having this continuity for this long is China, and that's 4,000 years. Uh, so an amazing um, length of time, but we will see changes within this length of time. So ancient Egyptian history, again, it's like kind of an overview. So the most important figure is the pharaoh, meaning a great house. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, in the United States, they'll say the White House this or the White House that, referring to the presidential administration. Uh, so just relating the leadership to the palace. Um, so the early pharaohs established their divinity. And often students will ask, like, uh, did people actually believe that they were gods or how did they convince people? Uh, that's an open question. Um, I would guess a lot of people didn't believe, but it, it, didn't, it probably didn't matter so much uh, when you have um, 
a structure and an army behind your power. Uh, people will believe what you tell them to believe. So what survives of Egypt are the tombs of the Pharaoh and the other important people. Uh, so elite people we're talking about. Um, I should change that to elite because they're not necessarily more important than the rest of us. The tombs are meant to be eternal. So they were made of stone and that's what we're seeing. Um, the cities were made of mud, brick, and wood. So those are long gone, but some of the tombs have some models of what the cities look like. Um, made out of stone, though. So the early pharaohs expected to live in the afterlife as they did in life. Providing for the afterlife in advance allowed people to anticipate active, happy lives relatively free from the fear of the great unknown because they knew that their cause would enjoy the same pleasure as they did in life. So the cause, the spirit of the dead king, uh, in later times, especially in the third intermediate period, a lot of people thought of themselves as having cause. Uh, so that's what Egyptian art is. We're going to see beautiful things, and they'll stand on their own as art, uh, but they have a function. Uh, it's a spiritual function to preserve the pharaoh. We'll also see that the later pharaohs, uh, even in the old kingdom, they kind of get more interesting as far as what they think the afterlife is, and they don't just want to do what they did uh, during life. So what is missing from Egyptian history? It's an easy question to answer. Uh, if any of you are kings or queens or princes or dukes or, or anything like that, uh, then you are included in this history. But if you're not an elite person, then you are not included. So the rest of us, the people that uh, do the work, the people, most of the people that make the art, uh, we're not preserved through time. Uh, so that's something that's important to remember when you study these elite cultures. Uh, a lot of times they just talk about the elite people, uh, but there was thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes millions of people that made what we're looking at happen. Uh, and sometimes the names, most of the times, the names of those people are forgotten. When we get closer to now, uh, we'll be able to talk about, and I'll put up the air quotes, regular people. So characteristics of Egyptian art, enduring and continuous, but not static. Uh, so you can recognize Egyptian art in that 3000 year time span, but there are changes and that's what we're gonna concentrate on. So the basic pattern of Egyptian institutions, beliefs and artistic ideas were formed during the first few centuries of that vast time span and was maintained until the end. So from Narmer, the first Pharaoh we're gonna look at 3000 BC, to we're not actually gonna look at Cleopatra the seventh, but you can check it out you'll see similarities. You'll see it's coming from the same style. And once you learn the iconography, you'll see that there's similar beliefs as well. So each of these qualities I'm gonna show you in a work of art so we can understand what they are. Uh, but I'll just go over them really quickly. Composite view. When I show you, you'll be able to understand what that is. Hieroglyphics, which is a Greek word. Uh, it means sacred writing. And this is something important to remember about hieroglyphics. Um, the images in Egyptian art are meaningless without the writing, which activates their spiritual power. So remember, these artworks are mostly uh, spiritual purpose. They're to preserve the Ka of the king. We'll see some that are from temples. Um, and how they get their power is through writing. So we're going to see some similarities when we get to West Africa, where there'll be symbols, iconography, and such that will be considered to be powerful in itself because it can... Um, imbue power or once it's activated by a particular person can activate power in objects or in people. Um, so that's kind of a similarity that we'll see. And hieroglyphics are not everyday writing. Egyptians developed other types of writing that's easy to write uh, for just everyday stuff like commerce or writing a letter or something like that. Um, hieroglyphics are different and they change through time um, you're highly unlikely, uh, even if you go to elite school, to ever meet someone that could read hieroglyphics. And if you did, they would probably only be able to read them from a certain time period. And um, it would take time for them to be able to translate them because they're often used very creatively um, and in different ways than an alphabetic language would be used. Uh, so kind of multiple layers of meaning with that. And that contributes to their power, uh, or so it was believed. So hierarchic scale, and this will be easier to see uh, in an image, but it basically means more important people or objects are larger at the top. And then registers, uh, which is the lines between uh, two-dimensional Egyptian art. And again, I'll show you how that works. So let's go to some imagery. 
this is whenever you take class like this, this is almost always the earliest uh, work of art that they show you from ancient Egypt. So the palette of King Narmer and it's from about 3100 BCE. Uh, it's made out of slate. It's pretty small. As you can see, it's 25 inches high. And the palette was originally used to put on makeup. When I flip it around and show you the other side, you'll be able to see where uh, the makeup would go. But this palette is more of a ceremonial palette. So it wouldn't necessarily be used to put on makeup. Both men and women wore um, black eye makeup because Egypt is bright. <laughs> so it can kind of like cut down on the glare. Um, it's very bright and sunny. Um, and But this one probably wasn't used for that purpose. So this is the oldest historical artwork. And when I do this in an in-person class, I usually ask people, what does history mean? Uh, so you can think about that if you want and pause. But I'll just tell you what it means if you haven't paused yet. Uh, historical means that there is writing. Uh, so if you look around the piece, see if you can find some of the writing. You know, pause it right now. And once you're ready, start it up again, and I'll show you some places where there's writing. The first thing is right here. Uh, that's a hieroglyphic. And that's how we know this is an armor. That's what these two symbols are. His name, we know he's a pharaoh. Well, besides his cool hat, I'll talk about that in a moment, is in what's called a seric. And this shows a shape that's basically the palace. Uh, so remember, pharaoh means great house, refers to the palace. Um, their name is within here. Uh, in later times, uh, the pharaohs will use cartouches for their names, and they'll have multiple names uh, that will be printed in those cartouches. Uh, but in the Old Kingdom, it's the Seric. And this is also the oldest portrayal of a named individual. So we have a few names, uh, specifically from ancient Egypt, that are earlier than this, uh, but we don't have any art attached to a name. So even though it's an oldest portrayal of a named individual, uh, don't think of these as portraits, uh, because they're not. Uh, they are pictures of what fairs are supposed to look like. What they actually look like um, wasn't important to the ancient Egyptians. And we'll see that's going to apply to all elite people. It's pictures of their status, um, not individual pictures. Um, and when we get to big changes, that'll be an important thing to remember. So Narmer is wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt here. On the flip side, he'll be wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt. And sometimes they can put them together. But again, symbolizing this Upper and Lower Egypt, even at this very early time, coming together. And that's basically what this palette says, bringing Upper and Lower Egypt together. Um, so Horus is the god of Upper Egypt. He's right here. Uh, and the py Pyrus plants symbolize Lower Egypt. And that's right there. So basically what this symbol says is the people from Lower Egypt conquered the people from Upper Egypt. Um, and that's where we believe the earliest pharaohs were from um, Upper Egypt. So Upper Egypt is towards um, southern modern Egypt and northern Sudan. So there's a few more hieroglyphics through here. This one right here identifying this figure. Another one here identifying this figure. And one right here and here. So these are all hieroglyphics. They're very early hieroglyphics, not nearly as complex as later ones, um, but they are used here. So a couple of things that we see, and if you've ever tried to draw an Egyptian figure, you probably noticed them, is the composite view. And the idea behind the composite view is the ancient Egyptians, again, they don't, they're not super interested in naturalism. They want to show each body part from what's considered to be the most distinctive or um, auspicious or characteristic view. Uh, so when you see an Egyptian, their face is in profile, but their eyes are from the front um, and they just kind of stick it on the side of your head. Um, we see the arms in profile and the chest from the front. Uh, we see the legs in profile, but the hips seem to be from the front. Uh, so Egyptians can do some pretty neat stuff. Um, and in the Old Kingdom, it even extends to things that seem uh, a little bit out there. Uh, the, the feet, it was considered seeing them from the big toe first was the best way. So in this one, uh, Narmer has two left feet. In the New Kingdom, you're allowed to have two, a left and a right foot. But in the Old Kingdom, uh, if he's facing this way, it's two left feet. If he was facing the other way, it would be two right feet. 
Um, and the one, one way that you can recognize a king, besides some of the iconography, which I'll go over in a minute, is they're portrayed in a more stylized and rigid way. Uh, so you can see that of all the figures, the king is portrayed in the most kind of rigid way. You can also tell who enemies are because they'll be portrayed in twisted ways with lines that aren't straight and solid like the pharaoh. Um, these straight solid lines try to say that the pharaoh is a god man um, who's forever. He's not in time. Whereas the enemies, they're in time. You know, they can be defeated like this one right here. And then the two men underneath are also enemies. The other way we can tell they're enemies is they're naked. Uh, so in ancient Pharaoh, in ancient Egypt, if you weren't wearing clothes, that meant you were an enemy. Obviously not what we're going to see in a lot of other cultures necessarily. Um, so some other ways you can tell it's the king. Uh, he's wearing this particular crown, but that changes throughout time. He's wearing the false beard. So this figure right here, you can tell he's a good guy because he's not twisted. Uh, but he's smaller. Uh, he's not wearing the fake beard. He's not wearing the crown. He's also not wearing a kilt uh, with this very, very long tail coming out of it. Um, all of this stuff is just for the pharaoh. And the fake beard is, um, is fake. Uh, it's um, kind of a strap, like it looks in a picture. Uh, and in some time, time periods, it was made out of like goat hair, and then it was stiffened, so it would stick out like that. Uh, ancient Egyptian elites usually shaved their bodies from head to toe, just everything. Um, obsidian, which is what they used, was kind of like an important commodity back then. And so it was a way to show your wealth, but also a way to prevent from getting lice. Uh, so whenever you see ancient Egyptian bodies, oftentimes their hair, that'll be wigs. Uh, and, you know, both men and women will wear wigs and, and shave off all of their hair. So he's also carrying a mace, uh, which is only for the pharaoh. And he's carrying this one piece of royal regalia, which nobody really knows what it is, uh, and it wasn't used past the very early Old Kingdom. His kilt is just for the pharaoh, and this tail represents the bull's tail. So the ancient pharaohs associated themselves with bulls. They raised cattle in ancient Egypt, uh, and that kind of makes sense. The pharaoh saw himself as a god. He saw himself as the person that made the rains come. Uh, and made the cattle fat. So he's kind of a, a representation of fecundity, which means a land that produces a lot. Um, and he kind of saw himself and promoted himself as being a person that brings all of that fecundity. Uh, so the bull's tail represents that. And also a lot of male leaders around the world, they like to be associated with bulls uh, because you know they have huge phalluses and they love to do that. So the bulls up here are also basically representations of the pharaoh, and we're going to see that on the flip side as well. So when we go to the flip side, um, I can talk a little bit about hierarchic scale and registers. Um, so in between the registers, you have a logic of hierarchic scale. Um, and then when you're in between two other registers, then you have a new logic of hierarchic scale. So I'll explain what I mean. So in between this register and this one, we have a bunch of figures. The biggest one is the most important. That's what hierarchic scale means. So that's the pharaoh right here. And then we can see the second most important and the third most important. And then these people are less and less important as we go down. This doesn't represent little people or children. It's, it's representing importance. So that's what hierarchic scale is. If you're more important, you're bigger. If you're less important, you're smaller. Uh, here he's wearing the red crown. Uh, the, the crown that's on the other side, the white crown, the red crown, can actually go to better, together to make a composite crown, but he's not wearing that right now. And right here, in between these registers, we see two figures, and we can see they're enemies because they're kind of twisted. Um, but they're bigger than the pharaoh. But since they're in between different registers, it doesn't apply. We can see the pharaoh again down here with a similar image basically to what's on the, on the bottom. The pharaoh is the bull and he's stomping on this enemy who we can tell is an enemy because he's naked and twisted. Uh, there's some more enemies in this picture and the pharaoh is kind of showing how you, and I put up the air quotes for unite an area, uh, he did so through violence. Uh, so we have a bunch of beheaded figures um, and with their heads in between their legs. Uh, so he's showing what he did 
uh, to be able to conquer Lower Egypt and make Egypt one country. So we're also seeing some composite view with this. So we're seeing all the figures as if they're in profile from the side, and we're seeing these figures as if they are on the ground. So we're seeing it from like a bird's eye view. So you'll see that kind of thing. Um, there isn't an importance in ancient Egypt to make a space that looks realistic uh, or naturalistic is the other word that you could use. So when we look at this, uh, I can show you a few more icons. And once you know these icons, and there's just a few simple ones, you can understand a whole lot in Egyptian imagery. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show you before I, I look at the icons is that the ancient Egyptians used a canon of proportions. Uh, that basically means that there is a mathematical relationship between different parts of the body. And this is especially important for the pharaoh, so our enemies might not have this mathematical relationship, but the pharaoh, since he's more important, he's going to be shown in this very conventionalized way. So one is, is that the distance from the hairline right here to the ground is 18 units. And you can count that up. It's exactly 18 units. Once you put that grid on there, and the ancient Egyptian uh, artists did that first before they made a two-dimensional work and three-dimensional works. They would put the grid down, and then they would carve or paint uh, into it. And this one is both carved and painted. And sometimes uh, the tombs would be unfinished, and you will see the lines are still left there. They didn't erase them. Uh, that's not the case with this. I put the lines over, uh, but just to give you an idea of what it looks like. So once you've got that lined up, everything else works. Uh, from the shoulder to the nose is one unit. As you can see here, the fingers of the clenched fist, fist, fist to the elbow is 4.5 units. You can see that's exactly here. Um, so the other thing you can notice with this is that he's got two right feet because he's facing in the other direction. Remember, that's part of the composite uh, view. And you can see how the chest is sort of painting, pointing towards the front, and then the arms uh, are pointing towards the side. So one of the things that he carries is a flail. And then later times, he'll be carrying a crook in this hand. Uh, the flail and then a crook, which is kind of a curved thing like this, are both agricultural implements. Again, the pharaoh associates himself with agriculture, and hence fecundity, bringing life to Kemet. And then um, we can see his strap-on beard. It's really obvious that it's a strap-on here. Uh, we can see the composite view with his eye, and he's wearing eye makeup, as everyone did. And then the basic symbols that you see. The first one that you're probably familiar with, because people are fond of wearing these, is the ankh. Uh, and that's right there. Oh. The ankh um, can mean a bunch of different things, uh, but in this case, it means life force. Uh, actually, I'll go over these uh, a little bit later. So with this, we would normally do it in class, uh, but I'm going to have a different assignment that we're going to have um, for our discussion. So the old kingdom. So now we can take a look at these symbols now that the grid is gone. The first one is the ankh. And I have on the side that means the life, but a better way to translate it would be life force. So the Ankh is that which brings life. Uh, so the Pharaoh considers himself kind of to be an Ankh, that which brings life. Uh, but we'll see later Pharaohs will use the Ankh being gifted um, by the gods to them. Uh, so it's almost thought that you could breathe this in and it creates life. The second one is the was, and this was actually a scepter that the pharaoh would hold sometimes, so called a was scepter. And that represents dominion. In other words, his power over the land of Egypt. Uh, and again, associating himself with the bull, uh, this cane, I know this sounds strange, was made with a bull phallus. Uh, and unfortunately, I read in Kemet, which is a Egyptology magazine um, for you know, Egyptologists, uh, kind of like a journal and popular magazine. Uh, someone actually made one of these was, was scepters out of a, a bull phallus. I'm sure that was tons of fun. Um, but again, associating himself with the male power of the bull and fecundity. Um, and then we have the Shen. Uh, and that is this ring right here, and it's worn as a ring. We can see another one about to be placed by Horus on 
the crown of the king. And that represents, like it does in many cultures, eternity. Uh, often the mummies of the pharaoh and other important people as well, they will be wearing Shen rings. And within the wrappings, there'll be lots of anks and Shen rings wrapped in there. So eternity and life. That's the one you want to give uh, someone. So what this is showing is the said festival. So every 30 years or 29 years, uh, depending on the time period, a, an Egyptian pharaoh would have to um, kind of recharge his kingship. He would ceremoniously die and he'd be wrapped um, like he was Osiris and he would go to the underworld ceremoniously. And then when he would come back up, he would be reborn um, as a new king. Uh, then he would have to run between these territorial markers, which were, I'll show you what some of them look like, are about 75 meters. Uh, in this one, Narmer is taking that in just one big old step. Uh, so he's not messing around here, but that shows the power of the king. Obviously, some of these pharaohs would be very old and they would hobble between the, the markers instead of, instead of run, which was they were expected to do. But these represent upper and lower Egypt, uh, so when we see them in tombs, they are always placed exactly north and south. Uh, and tombs, all the tombs we're going to look at, um, except for the ones in the New Kingdom, are going to be oriented perfectly north, south, east, and west. So look at the pyramids. Um, and the pyramids, there's a lot of them, but not as many as you would expect. Uh, there's only about 100 pyramids in Egypt, and we'll look at some later ones as well. Uh, there's actually far more pyramids in Meso and South America. Um, <laughs> far more, like 100,000. Uh, but if you're thinking of the pyramids, usually what you're thinking of is the Great Pyramids at Giza. And they were built by the dynasty four kings, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkari. Uh, and these dates, if you see dates in another book, they might be 100 years earlier. It's not a big deal, so I'll just I'll be using these dates on the test. Khufu is the oldest, so he's the grandfather. Khafre is the son. Menkari is the grandson. Khufu is, is the biggest. It was in the background here. It doesn't look as big in this picture, but it's slightly bigger than Khafre's. Uh, which is the second one, and then Mankari's was much, much smaller. Uh, so it may be that, um, you know, people thought there was better things to put time and energy into than, than building pyramids. These are the first true pyramids. Uh, so before this, they had um, step pyramids, uh, and eventually they tried to make smooth-sided pyramids and failed a few times. You can look up the red pyramid and the bent pyramid. Uh, but Khufu's was the first that survived, and it's also the tallest it was ever built. Uh, in fact, it was the tallest structure made by humans of any kind uh, until about 1500s or so. Uh, so that's a long time. <laughs> uh, it's about 425 feet or 450 feet if the rest of the pyramid was still there. So as far as the shape of the pyramid... We don't know because the ancient Egyptians didn't write about it, uh, but it, later Egyptians in the New Kingdom wrote about these kind of ideas, so it may be related to an imitation of the sun's rays. Uh, so think of how you would draw rays coming from the sun when you were a child. The king could climb up the rays in the afterlife to join the sun god Ra. Uh, the shape also could re represent the Benben zone and Heliopolis. That just means... Uh, Helio means sun, um, polis means city, so city of the sun. Um, and the pharaohs of this dynasty were the first kings to refer to themselves as the sons of Ra. So what was believed by this pharaoh and all of the later pharaohs is that um, their earthly mother, that was called the king's mother, who is the second most important person in Egypt, she sometimes be called the god's mother, and I'll explain why in a second, uh, because they believe that Ra, the sun god, uh, came into um, the, the king's mother's bedchamber at night and impregnated her. And when the pharaoh was born, he was half the son of Ra and his earthly mother. Um, so they literally considered themselves, you know, like Heracles from ancient Greece, to be um, half God, half man. Um, and that would continue uh, throughout the new kingdom.
So the step pyramid was the first kind of development before they got to this. As you can see, it's only about 100 years before. And it was the first monumental stone architecture in the world. Uh, it's also the first uh, artist that we know by name, uh, and that's Imhotep. Uh, so the first architect that we know by name. Uh, and it's spelled uh, Z-O, sometimes you'll see it spelled D-J, so Zoser. It uh, doesn't matter, either way is, is acceptable. Um, and according to Lawler, it set the standard for future pharaonic tombs. So this one's not quite as interesting as, as the later ones, as we'll see. It's constructed in a necropolis. Uh, that means, necro means dead, and polis means city, so the city of the dead, of Saqqara to house the tomb of King Djoser. Um, and Imhotep basically came up with the idea. It used to be that elite people were buried in this flat thing called a mastaba. Uh, and he, he came up with the idea to kind of build that up over time. Uh, and then the pharaoh was still alive. Pharaohs start building their tombs as soon as they become pharaoh. So they made it bigger, and then he kept living, and they made it even bigger, and they ended up with this. Uh, and it went inside of this complex where he could do all the things that he did in life forever. But the later pharaohs got to do more interesting things. So the pyramids were originally finished with gleaming white limestone. So this picture, I know it's kind of a cheesy reproduction, but it does give you an idea of what they would have looked like originally. The top may have been gold or copper, um, which were both available to the Egyptians at this time. And it would have made it so the sun would come down and you would see a light reflecting off of it from very far away. Um, if you've ever been to Las Vegas, you may have noticed the the Luxor in Las Vegas Hotel. Uh, they have a big light coming off this pyramid-shaped hotel. So whenever the king died, uh, his body would be brought to the Valley Temple. That's what's shown right here. It's still there, but it's no longer on the Nile because the Nile is a big, powerful river and has moved pretty far away from this area. Um, but the building is still there, and he would be brought there, and he would be, sometimes they'd be mummified somewhere else, sometimes in here and they'd be blessed, uh, and then they would be brought into this thing called a causeway. So a causeway, as you can see, has a slit at the top because it's pretty dark in there. Uh, they want to keep it hidden from everybody else, uh, and they would be um, burning candles, so you don't want to suffocate while you're making this big trip to the funerary temple. As this progresses, it would become more and more elite. So here you may have the people doing the preparations, uh, for his body uh, to make it into a mummy. Um, but as you got into the funerary temple, it would only be a few people. And then when his body is brought in, it would just be the high priest um, and the king and then whoever was bringing the body. Uh, so that's the way Egyptian religion worked, became more and more elite going into smaller and smaller spaces. Although this space, <laughs> the space he's inside is pretty small, but the actual building is huge. So these fourth dynasty funerary complexes had a different purpose than the one at Saqqara. So Saqqara, it was basically just built so the king could do what he did in life forever. This one's more interesting. The king's funerary monuments no longer catered for the king's eternal reenactment of the territorial rituals of kingship. Instead, the king became an earthly manifestation of the sun god, expressed in the form of the king's filial relationship to Ra. That just means like a, a brotherly um, or family relationship. And at death, he joined the sun god on his eternal cycle of renewal. So eventually, these stories, which originally just applied to the pharaoh, um, started to apply to other people, and they were collated in what's called the Book of the Dead. Um, and if you get a chance to visit the Detroit Institute of Art, they have one of these. They were often printed on tombs. And then later times, even regular people who had tombs would get it printed. Uh, and it tells all the stories of the things that can happen when you travel to the underworld or through the heavens. Um, but it started with the Pharaoh, and these beliefs um, eventually were written down later. So the inside of Khufu's pyramid, the first one, is really interesting compared to the other ones, and we're not sure what it's all about. Some things we know about, uh, and some things we don't know. Uh, and I'm going to put a link in the extra credit board, to some videos you can check out uh, if you're interested in some of the hypotheses about what this stuff is all about and how they built the pyramids, because we don't actually know that either. Um, definitely built by Egyptians, though, not aliens. 
Uh, so you can see here that there was originally a chamber that was far underground. Uh, that's what, how uh, Zoser at Soccer was, was buried, although it didn't stop him from getting robbed. Uh, same thing with this tomb. Um, so they may have built this chamber so they could keep the king somewhere in case he died while they were still building it. But he, he was eventually buried here. The place was robbed several times um, over the thousands of years. So there was nothing left in there except a sarcophagus, which is a stone box. But everything else was gone out of it. Um, and there's a grand gallery that's leading up. One of the videos I show you will have an interesting idea about the grand gallery. And this chamber, which is relatively small in the middle of this man-made mountain, basically, uh, with millions of metric tons of stone above them, the rest of the building is basically solid. So you can imagine that would be kind of sketchy to have an open space in there. So they lined it with granite. <laughs> which is a very hard stone. Uh, the rest of it is made out of limestone. And um, that wasn't good enough. They noticed that it didn't seem like it was going to support it very well. So they made these relieving um, kind of granite chambers. And then they made basically what's a simple arch. Um, so two, square, two um, blocks going this way. And what that does is basically distribute the force that's above it away from the chamber. And it worked. Uh, 4,500 years later, it's totally safe to go in there. Uh, but you can see the cracks that open that probably caused them to make this thing in the first place. The other thing that's called the Queen's Chamber, it isn't really. It may have been another room that they were going to put the Pharaoh if, if he died early. Um, they just call it the Queen's Chamber because it's smaller. Um, it doesn't actually mean anything. And then we have these passages. Don't know what they mean. Uh, robots have been sent out, up into it. Uh, so there's some speculation on what it would mean. Um, these, like the earlier tombs, were made exactly north, south, east, and west. Uh, and this one, uh, the shaft points to the North Star of the Old Kingdom, Thuban. Um, our North Star is Sirius, um, obviously, um, but since this was so long ago, they had a different North Star, and in the future we'll have a, a different North Star. Uh, and then the shaft points to Orion's belt. Uh, the Egyptians didn't consider that to be Orion, but they did consider that um, particular arrangement of stars to be pretty interesting. But we don't know uh, if it's that important. Um, we're not sure. So there's some ideas. They do orient the pyramid with the eternal stars. So the North Star is the one star that doesn't seem to move. Uh, so it's, you know, like the Pharaoh wants to be, eternal and unmoving. And then the shaft thus served as a kind of escape hatch that allowed the pharaoh to take his place as a star in the cosmos. So the thought is that his ka would leave his body as a spirit uh, and go through the shaft and go through the heavens with Amun-Ra, uh, then return and go into the other world um, with Osiris. So that's just one idea, but we don't actually know because the pharaohs didn't really say, uh, the ancient Egyptians didn't really say much about um, why they were making some of these things. So how were they built? Uh, the big mystery is not what they're made out of. Um, we know that. Uh, but it's how did they get these stones um, to the top of the pyramid um, when they didn't have the wheel? <laughs> so that's kind of a big deal. They also only had stone and copper tools, which is something else. Uh, no wheel, but they could have had rollers. They had wheels and toys later on, and then wheels and chariots, but that was much after, long, long after this time. Uh, and many of the blocks, and we can see some of the original outside blocks here, uh, were perfectly fitted. Uh, so those were carved to fit in place. Most of what you see here is the interior blocks, um, because people had stolen the blocks on the outside because they're really nice and <laughs> left the inside ones. So the big problem with this is that if they use stones, um, these stones are really heavy. And it's a really basic physics problem to figure out uh, what would need to be done uh, to be able to bring them up here. You would basically need a ramp whose angle was no more than seven or eight degrees. The sides of the pyramid are 70 degrees. <laughs> uh, so you can't drag these stones that are at the top up the top of the pyramid uh, when you don't have the wheel. So they couldn't have done it that way. Uh, one thought is maybe they made a big giant ramp at like seven, eight, nine degrees. 
but that would actually be a bigger job than making the pyramid itself. So there's a couple of ideas on how this could be done. Uh, we also have no evidence whatsoever that we can figure out right now of, of ramps uh, and the tools that they were used. We do have some sleds, uh, and it'll be shown in one of the videos I should, that um, I'll put in the extra credit board, but other than that, we don't know. So there's a couple of ideas. One idea, which I'm just gonna tell you right away, um, isn't considered to be an idea that uh, most people would embrace anymore. Uh, so it's probably not true, and I'll tell you why in a minute, moment, but it is ingenious and it could have been done this way if they would have thought of it. Uh, so this article written by Barson, Gangley, and Hug, it's written in, in a um, material science journal. Uh, and I actually read it, didn't understand it a lot, so <laughs> I had other people help me understand it. They had a theory that you could use reconstituted blocks, so basically concrete. All the concrete is is some crushed up stones, uh, something sticky, and some water. So basically they said that you could take bags of stones up, you know, small bags, drag them up to the top, um, and then, you know, pump the water up there, and, and we know they knew how to do things like that, uh, and bring up the sticky stuff, and just do it in small bags, that way you could drag it right up the side, and then create forms, uh, and pour this stuff into it, mix it up, and since uh, Egypt is so dry and hot, it would dry relatively quickly, and then you could just build it like that. That would also make it easier to fit the blocks together. Uh, so in this article, they got some stones uh, from one of the pyramids. And according to them, their conclusions were that these couldn't be natural stones. They had to be reconstituted. Um, and it's kind of complicated. It has to do with the way that the crystals were oriented. And this caused a big stir when this article came out. And many other scientists in the field wrote in and said, no, you read it wrong. And then um, the authors were hoping to get more samples, but that never happened. But I'll tell you why I don't think that this is the way it was made, and most people don't. Um, it totally could have been made that way, and if you would go back in time and tell them that, they probably would have, uh, but they didn't. Uh, there are quarries around this area, and it's, they're missing a whole lot of stone. Uh, and if you kind of back of the nap, napkin roughly look at the amount of stone that was taken out, that's how much stone is in the pyramids. So it was made with stone, but how, how'd they get them up to the top? Uh, so there's a couple of ideas um, and that one of them comes from Jean-Pierre Houdin and he thought of a ramp that is on the inside of the pyramid and that's why we don't see any evidence of it anymore. And then after they finished the pyramid, it would, they would fill it in as they go down. So the ramp would twist around on the inside and it could be about seven or eight degrees and that way you could get it up there bring it out to the top and, and place it. Uh, so I'll put a link for this video. If you don't have Hulu, don't worry. I'll put a link for YouTube or, or um, another service. YouTube actually usually removes them right away. And you can check that out. I'll also put a link for this video as well. So how were the pyramids built? I don't know. Maybe go on the extra cut up board and see if you can come up with some ideas. Uh, so this one we're not going to do. That's a more of an in-class assignment thing. So skip this. And uh, this lecture is way longer than the ones I usually have. The rest of them are broken into pieces. So take breaks, you know, stop, and then come back to it later. Because <laughs> none of them are going to be this long. This is the longest one just because it's Egypt. Uh, the rest of them will be much shorter. Uh, so we're still in the Old Kingdom and we're looking at the Great Sphinx, which is also a bit of a mystery. We know how it was made, uh, but we don't know who it was made for and even when it was made. Uh, we know it's a pharaoh because he's wearing the Nimi's headdress, so this type of crown, only the pharaoh can wear it. Um, and the Sphinx is associated with the sun god. Uh, later pharaohs would put like many sphinxes with their faces on it. Sphinx is just a human head uh, with a lion. Uh, lying down, just like my little kitty is lying down now. And uh, there's a few different thoughts about what this was for. Uh, so these are each different thoughts, uh, and we're not sure exactly uh, which one is true. So one thought is the Sphinx guarded the procession away from the Valley Temple to the Funerary Temple. Um, the location of the Sphinx suggests that it represented Khafre, uh, so it's 
um, near his valley temple. It also faces the rising sun, which reinforces its association with the pharaoh. Another thought um, coming from Jansen is that the Sphinx is Khufu. And then Reader, who's the only Egyptologist out of all these sources, says that it predates Khufu. So it may be that this was built on site and then um, Khufu's architects and artists thought this would be a cool place to place um, their big giant tombs. So how this thing is made is different than the pyramids. The pyramids are made out of stones that were quarried somewhere else. This is living rock. Uh, so this was once a hill, uh, and how this was made is it was carved out of the living rock downwards. Uh, so what they would do is carve a nice block and shape, uh, draw grids on it, and then carve it out from there. When you're looking at the paws here, these are um, modern additions, and they're there partially so that you can get an idea of what it originally looked at like, but also because um, in the 19th century, uh, this was unburied. So uh, in the 19th century, the sand used to go up to the pharaoh's neck. And um, the British thought it would be pretty interesting to dig them up. Uh, so they did. And then once it was exposed to the air for a while, some of the stones started to wear away. And some were wearing away more than others. So this is a problem that actually will have to be fixed. They're not sure why some layers of stone are wearing away faster, but um, if it's not fixed, it'll eventually collapse. So some of these additions were made so that it doesn't fall. Uh, we can see a little bit of what the original one looked like. Obviously his face has been sandblasted. Um, like, I don't think I, I would look that good if I had my face out in the sun and sand and sandstorms for 4,000 years. Um, but we can get an idea of what it originally looked like. So it wouldn't have looked like this. Uh, everything would have been detailed and you would have been able to see the lion, but out of the living rock. So kind of amazing how much stone would be removed just to get started on this thing and then to carve it um, out of this <clears throat> pre-existing hill. So it's 66 feet high and 240 feet long. It's a lot of digging. So if you look at uh, smaller sculpture, uh, more human sized. This is a siege statue of Khafre, and it's from Giza. Uh, and this is important because this sculpture is beautiful, uh, but think about what was done with it. Uh, the sculpture was found in the Valley Temple of Khafre's pyramid complex. Its function is to embody the Ka, the spirit of the king. The priests of Khafre's cult would make offerings to the statue. So the way that it was buried, it was actually kept in a room um, where there was only this and there was a door in front of it and the door had a tiny hole in it. Uh, and the hole wasn't so that people could look in. So that was so Khafre's Ka could look outwards. Uh, so once this beautiful sculpture was made out of very hard stone by the best artist, because the Pharaoh could get the best artist, diorite, um, and the stone was imported from Nubia. So it's hard stone to get um, and hard stone to work with. And it was originally painted, so it would have been in bright colors and shimmering. Um, it was then put into a hole in the ground and nobody would ever see it again until it was dug up uh, a few thousand years later. So that shows you how important the purpose of the art is. It does look beautiful, um, but the purpose is more important um, than people being able to see the finished product in this case. So Egyptian artists follow certain conventions, both for sculptures in the round and in the relief. The more important the personage represented, the more rigorous, rigorously the conventions were observed. So some of these conventions, what people usually notice is they have this narrow waist, uh, a kind of muscular body, rather youthful body. Um, we can see that he's very stiff. Uh, he has a blank expression. He's almost looking over you like you don't exist. Uh, so he has this timeless quality. Uh, pharaohs aren't in time. Remember, they're gods. They're forever. They're like this hard stone. Uh, and then what he's doing here is reaching out for offerings and we'd have hold, held some royal regalia that I showed you previously in this hand. So he's also wearing the Nimi's headdress. Only the pharaoh gets to wear this. And that has your uraeus at the top, which is partially worn off. Uh, but that's a rearing cobra symbol of Ra. Uh, later pharaohs would also have neck bet um, next to it. 
So his throne is decorated with intertwining plants that represent Upper and Lower Egypt. That's called the Semitawi motif, and it's used all the way up to the time of Cleopatra the Seventh. Uh, so the Semitawi uh, motif, which says, "I brought together Upper and Lower Egypt," keeps being used by pharaohs in much later times. So the diorite. Again, it's imported from Nubia, so that shows uh, like multiple levels of power uh, because Nubia is a bit south, uh, but it is closer to where the original pharaohs came from. And we'll talk about Nubia a little bit later on. So this one I usually do as kind of an in-class assignment, um, but we're going to do a different one. Uh, so this one, I'll kind of just do it along with you. Uh, this shows the pharaoh and... Recent research has shown it could be his wife, the queen, but it could also be his mother. And usually what I ask people in the class is kind of tell me what they're seeing here. I want them to notice is that the pharaoh is a bit taller. I remember hierarchy scale, so he's a bit more important than this figure. Um, he's stepping forward a little bit farther. So again, that's the type of hierarchy scale. He's a bit stiffer. Um, and she's a bit softer, but the both of them have pretty blank faces. Again, they're living in time, so they don't, they don't smile, they don't do any of those things. Um, but a lot of people look at this gesture, the way she's holding them, in different ways. Some people will see it as support. Others will see it as like she's kind of moving him in a certain way, or others will be like he's trying to get into a fight and she's holding him back. Um, but those of you that kind of look at it as support, uh, new research may show that instead of this being the queen, that it could be his mother. So remember, uh, the god's mother or the king's mother is the second most important person in ancient Egypt. So that would totally make sense if they would show his mother rather than his wife. So other things you may notice are the clothing. He's wearing the kilt with the bull's tail, Nimi's headdress, all, all the things that the pharaoh wears, uh, the strap on beard. Um, she's wearing a, um, this is actually a covering for a wig. Um, and then she's wearing clothing. We can't really see the seams there, but they would be here. I'll show you another one. And it's a very sheer garment. So that's why her body is showing through. Very thin linen that was white that you could see through was kind of an elite type of thing to wear. Um, and that's what we're seeing. So this one shows you the way that all of the earlier ones where the paint had worn off, they would have originally looked like this. Uh, this is Prince Rehotep and his wife, Nafret. And we can see that they're not as important as the pharaoh. Um, the pharaoh and his wife or mother are portrayed with slate, a very hard stone. And we saw diorite from Khafre, also a hard stone. This is limestone, which is softer. And he's also literally smaller than the sitting Khafre. Sitting Khafre is five feet six. This one is three feet 11. Uh, so we have hierarchic scale and hierarchic scale when it comes to materials. Uh, the more important you are, the harder the stone is. But the painting uh, would have been very similar. Uh, so the colors of the skin are just conventions that differentiate men from women in the Old Kingdom. Uh, so in the Old Kingdom, they had this kind of like red-brown color for men. Uh, and this would probably be closer to the color of the actual people. And then they had this light color for women. This doesn't mean that women like bleached their skin or tried not to go out in the sun or something for years at a time. It was just a convention. In the New Kingdom, we'll see that men will stay this color and then they'll make women um, a dark brown color. Um, so just a convention for the old kingdom. It doesn't relate to how people actually looked at all. With this, you can see her sheer garment that she's wearing, similar to the mother or queen from the previous one. But our important guy, he's just wearing a kilt. It's a nice one, uh, but we know he's not the pharaoh. Uh, he's not wearing a crown. He doesn't have the fake beard. He doesn't have all the other regalia. Uh, he does have a stupendous mustache, though, all right? So this last one um, is a scribe, and he's from Saqqara. And scribes were well-educated, so they show them writing. They're not like court reporters. Uh, instead, they would be important advisors, like um, presidents, maybe not the current one, but 
previous ones. They'll have a bunch of people around them with degrees from Harvard and Yale. Uh, that would be this type of person that we're looking at in the picture. They study law, mathematics, and religion. Um, so a scribe, translate that more to like a scholar or um, advisor, an intellectual. <laughs> um, when you get in close, you can see that he's quite a bit different than what we saw from the prince and from the pharaoh. He's in time. So a lot of times when people see his face, they think, hmm, it's almost like he had an expression, like someone called and tried to get his attention. And we can see like his cheekbones kind of coming up and the corner of his mouth coming up. So he seems to be more in time. His eyes are made out of fiance. Uh, rarely Egyptians will have like blue gray eyes, but they use fiance because it was glass-like. Um, it's not supposed to show those eyes were blue. His eyes were probably brown. Um, but it looks cool, so they use that for the eyes. Uh, and then the rest of it is, is a soft stone, just like we saw with the prince. So when we see him from the side, we can see he's like uh, not like the pharaoh or like the prince. Uh, his body is quite a bit different. Um, so why is that so? Uh, and it's kind of easy to think about. Like, so remember, these aren't pictures of the people. Um, and even though the pharaoh is shown as very muscular, we'll see other times when the pharaoh is not shown this way. So this was the convention during the Old Kingdom. He probably didn't look like this. I mean, pharaohs aren't spending all their time like in the gym working out. Uh, and same thing with the seated scribe. He may have been very fit. Um, people, average people in Egypt who are farmers, like half people would look more like the pharaoh. Pharaoh probably looked more like this. Uh, but what they're showing by showing him as kind of mushy, it shows that he doesn't do physical labor uh, for a living. So it shows him as an elite person. And all of the artists, architects, scholars were shown in this way. Uh, so um, in modern times, this would be seen as being like if you were chubby or had a little bit extra, maybe it would be seen as like a class marker that you were lower class or something. Uh, and upper class people can afford trainers and the gym and such. But that's not the case back then. Instead, it would show his class, his status in society as an intellectual. So we can see the differences. Uh, you know, there's some people who are more elite than others. Uh, so we have a hard stone, a softer stone, more formal, and then more in time. Uh, so he's not as important. So he actually exists in time, whereas the pharaoh is timeless. Uh, rigid versus naturalistic. So he's a little softer, again, showing him in time. Uh, large versus small, like literally the sculptures are both sitting, but one is much larger than the other. Uh, more geometric versus more rounded. So another way that the artist communicated eternity is by kind of leaving the pharaohs in the stone. They did the same thing with, with the uh, pharaoh and his wife. So not carved out completely, and it shows that kind of association with stone, which doesn't seem to change, and um, showing the king as being eternal. But again, the scribe lives in time, so he's carved out. Um, this was originally painted, so painted versus unpainted is important. Uh, more erect and then a little softer and sitting on the floor. Uh, Nimi's headdress, nothing, so different status. And we see kind of more relaxed hands and not so relaxed here. So again, this would be a good time to take a break. Uh, I'm actually going to pause my video uh, recording and resume it again so I get some water, but take a break and then we'll go over the New Kingdom. So we'll move on to the New Kingdom. <laughs> Maybe you should play this as double speed on YouTube. None of the lecture is going to be long, this long, just this one. Uh, so take lots of breaks. So the 18th and 19th dynasties that we're going to talk about in the New Kingdom, and they were the height of the Egyptian empire. So Egypt moved far beyond the borders of what I've showed you so far, both to the south and to the north, and they became the most powerful state that had ever existed um, in the history of the world at this point. I start with this slide because this is a piece that I saw in an exhibit called The Pharaohs of the Sun about Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and Tutankhamun, who we're going to talk about. And this was thought to be one of the royal daughters, uh, one of the princesses. We'll see other pictures of them. 
And um, I was really blown away. It, it wasn't as big as if we were in, in the classroom and we were seeing it on the screen. It's human sized, uh, but how natural it was uh, and seeing it there and seeing the um, kind of contrast and texture between the smooth skin here and even smoother here, almost making it look like the lips were wet as people do make something look more alive. So some of these pieces, um, this was found in a sculptor studio. Some of the pieces we're gonna look at from this period were very strange looking, uh, but some of the things that were found in the sculptor studio were very naturalistic, like more naturalistic than you would see in other types of Egypt. Uh, so you can kind of see the process of how artists developed from something that was very much like the real world to the strange things that we're gonna see from this period a little bit later on. So I'm just gonna show you the unusual people in the New Kingdom. Uh, so the first thing is Queen Hatshepsut. Uh, she was a female th pharaoh, so literally a female king uh, who had succeeded her husband, Thutmose II. So normally what happens is if a pharaoh dies and um, his successor is too young, like a child, someone will rule as a regent. And sometimes the queen will rule as a regent until the kid grows up. But Hatshepsut uh, had other ideas. I think she saw that there was enemies uh, and against her and maybe against what she thought her husband would do. Um, so she declared herself pharaoh, um, meaning king. So if you hear anyone say Queen Hatshepsut, she was for a little while, but she was really King Hatshepsut. Um, and, you know, obviously a lot of people are angry about, about this and she killed some of those people and they were still angry, but didn't do anything about it. Um, and um, she started to have the art made of her as a pharaoh. And the artists were a little confused because they had conventions for queens. They had conventions for kings. Uh, they didn't have conventions for femme pharaohs. Uh, so what they did is they would just kind of compromise. Uh, sometimes, like she is in this one, she's portrayed exactly as the male king would be. You probably look at the face and say, well, that's kind of soft. Um, that was the style. Uh, that's the way her husband was portrayed as well at the time. Uh, they portrayed them basically as like teenage boys, more or less, as kind of youthful uh, and rather pretty, I guess you could say. Um, so in this case, she's portrayed as a male king. Uh, and you can see, by the way, this is in uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, if you want to see it in person. And at other times, they kind of go halfway between. Uh, they would show her with the Nimi's headdress, She's the king, uh, but then she would be wearing clothes like a queen would wear, um, but she's portrayed in a throne like the king would, would sit in. Um, so they didn't really have conventions for it, so they just kind of did what they could as they went along. So in the Amarna period, they had another change that was even more extreme than what we saw from Hatshepsut. So there were, I have to give you a little background so you can understand why this happened. Uh, so during the 18th dynasty, the priests of Amun-Ra at Thebes, which is the southern capital, were very rich and powerful. Um, and that happens if you have a very complex uh, kingdom or empire. In this case, uh, you have to have a lot of people who are doing the work on the ground, a lot of bureaucracy. And um, oftentimes through history, people who are monarchs, like pharaohs, um, will get distrustful and see these bureaucracies as having more power than them. And that was already seemed to be happening um, at this point with the priests at Amun-Ra. So the period name is from the modern name of the city where Amenhotep IV, which is his original name, moved his capital. Uh, so it's Tel Amarna, it just means like a, an area that they found it in. So Akhenaten, what he did to kind of like break this power of the priests at Amun-Ra uh, at Thebes and um, concentrate power on himself is he eliminated the worship of all other gods other than the Aten, uh, especially Amun-Ra. So Amun-Ra is the sun god. The Aten is the sun itself, so the sun disk. Uh, it's a different god. Um, Amun-Ra is the god of the sun, separate from the sun, but Aten is um, the sun itself. And he said, no more worshiping Amun-Ra. So right away, um, you know, donations, all the things that these priests kind of run on, um, he's taken out from under them. 
He then made a bunch of other changes, including the art, which we're going to see in a moment. He changed his name from Amenhotep, which means Amen is content, to Akhenaten, which means servant of the Aten. And then the capital he, he built from the ground up, uh, he called it Aket Aten, the horizon of the Aten. So this is actually a fairly common technique um, by autocratic rulers when they feel that um, the power isn't centralized in them and they don't have control of everything. Um, so the first thing he does is he takes out some of the basis of their power. The worship of Amun Ra is no longer associated with the Pharaoh. Uh, it takes away a lot of money and prestige as well. And then he says, if you want to rule with me, you have to move away from the capital in Thebes to this new place that I'm building from the ground up. Um, so it's this idea, <laughs> and I think um, in the Godfather, uh, the movie, it's portrayed the best way. Uh, Michael Corleone, he's, he's um, the head of this crime family, and he talks about the best advice his father gave him, and that was um, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. And so that was what Akhenat was trying to do. He said, if you want to be part of my government, you have to be close to me all the time. And that way he could know what everyone's doing uh, and centralize power in himself. And lots of other historical leaders did this as well. Uh, in my Asian class, I talk about uh, Tokugawa in the Edo period in Japan. He did basically the same thing. Uh, so remember that if you ever become an autocratic ruler, keep your friends close uh, and your enemies closer because uh, it works. So to go along with this new worship and these changes, uh, the artists also changed the way that the pharaoh was represented. And the way we're looking at it, you're probably seeing a lot of changes. Uh, one of the things that people notice is he's skinny. Uh, the pharaohs of this time, they were still rather muscular. They had those like kind of young boy faces, but they still had like pretty muscular bodies. But this one, he's skinny. Um, he's got pretty wide hips. Uh, so very kind of like feminine type of hips and a small waist that's rather feminine. And even like the stomach that sticks out, um, many students, especially ones that are older, uh, will say that looks like um, a postpartum belly. So from someone who had had a child, these are all significant. Um, very skinny arms, a long neck, um, his face has changed. I mean, you don't really see humans that look like this. Uh, the eyes have become extremely wide. It almost looks like his face is kind of melting off of his skull. Uh, everything is sticking out very far and it's kind of like droopy to a certain extent. Um, it can be really beautiful though, um, especially with some of the, the portrayals. This, sometimes Akhenaten can turn out kind of alien looking. <laughs> uh, so all of these changes, what's the deal with all of these changes? Uh, and you can compare him to the way that Amenhotep III was portrayed. So still has a pretty feminine face, but, you know, and wide eyes. But, man, things have really changed. This person still looks like a human. Um, this person has changed quite a bit. And um, we see both uh, masculine and feminine qualities. So why? Why did we change this? Um, one hypothesis that some had taken seriously, but they really shouldn't have, was, and you can look this up if you want, something called Marfan syndrome, M-A-R-F-A-N. Uh, and you can see pictures of people that have Marfan syndrome, which is genetic. And you can kind of see why they might think that Akhenaten had that and they were trying to portray him in that way. Uh, people with Marfan syndrome are very, very tall. They lack muscle tone. Uh, and their faces are kind of elongated like this because they have trouble with their connective tissue. Uh, but it's genetic. And luckily... Uh, in 2012, the genes of the bodies of the pharaoh and Tutankhamun and some other people were tested, and there isn't Marfan syndrome in the family. But nobody should have really taken that seriously anyway, uh, because that's not what pharaohs are. Like, Amenhotep III didn't look like this any more than Akhenaten looked like this. Um, remember, they're portraying status and what the pharaoh means. Uh, so Akhenaten had this change because what the pharaoh is has changed, and he wanted the art to show that as well. So drooping belly, elongated face and neck, full ups, thin arms, wide hips, an egg-shaped head, which is easier to see if you see 
it in profile. So this is his child, um, very strange head. Uh, you're probably not going to see people like that in real life. And when I'm using naturalistic here, I mean more relaxed. So you'll see a lot of things where the pharaoh isn't as stiff. He's actually existing in time sometimes. So what's up with that? Why is he like that? Um, it's the only time I ever reference any work I did, but it's not particularly original work. Uh, but this is from my undergraduate thesis, and I'll explain. Uh, I came to the same conclusion everybody else did. Undergrad thesis. Uh, so the ancient myth, Memphite myth of the creator god is the story of the Adam. Uh, Adam rose self-created from the primeval waters of the creation myth. He masturbated and ejaculated a son and daughter. So Adam doesn't have a gender. He's all genders. Uh, the sun, Shu, was the god of air who separated the earth and sky. His twin sister, Tefnut, became the goddess of moisture, so separation between the feminine and the masculine. Since Adam was one form, he was androgynous and genderless, the mother and father of all things. Aten combined the male and the female forms in the same way as Adam. So we're seeing Aten pictured here. It's the sun uh, in the center between the pharaoh and Nefertiti, his wife. And you can see how there's an even amount of stuff going on both sides. Uh, so Akhenaten, he wrote, maybe he had someone ghostwrite it for him, but this thing called the Hymns of the Aten. And it talks about what this new belief is. Uh, so in the Hymns of the Aten, the speaker refers to the Aten in its creator aspect by saying, hark to the chicken the egg, he who speaks in a shell. Uh, so this kind of like creation type of image. The Aten is likened to an egg, which is a symbol of the origin of life. This may explain why the shape of the heads of Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and especially their children are shaped like an egg. So you'll notice Nefertiti, she looks the same as her husband. Um, they have this both gendered quality. Um, and remember when the pharaohs associated themselves with Amun-Ra, they saw themselves as gods and they were bringing everything to the earth. So Aten brings the ox, which are being held to the nose, um, to the pharaoh and his wife, and the two of them bring everything to um, the people of Egypt. So when you get close, you can see at the end of the, the rays of the sun are these hands, and they hold the ankh to the pharaoh and to his daughter. And the way that this picture is done is not like any other pharaoh before or since portrayed himself. He showed doing normal family stuff, um, and his wife as well. So they have their kids sitting on their lap. He's giving his, his kid a kiss. They're in time doing normal human stuff. Oh, you can also see they have right and left feet as well. Um, that is unusual. And there's a bunch of ideas on how that could be. It could be that uh, the imagery is supposed to show that, you know, Akhenaten and Nefertiti were closer to the people than previous pharaohs. If you're going to change everything around, you know, you might want to, Make sure that everybody agree, you know, all the people on the ground agree with you, even though all the people in power might hate you and want to kill you. Um, or it could be just um, a way to show like a more um, just kind of fatherly instead of God-like separate from everybody type of image. So fatherly and motherly uh, for both of them since they're kind of showing both genders. Um, so this is really important when you think about um, these balance between genders, but also uh, people having both qualities, because uh, we're going to see that show up again, especially when we get to West Africa. Uh, so the last one I'm going to show you is one of those more naturalistic ones. So it's idealized. Uh, Nefertiti might not have been uh, this perfect and symmetrical and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it does show something that looks more like real life. And these, this is found in that sculptor studio I was telling you about before. Uh, and everybody laughed after Akhenaten died. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, and has a striking naturalism. And Nefertiti, as we already saw in the picture, she's kind of more important um, than previous um, queens. Uh, like the pharaohs after this, you know, showed the queens as tiny and the pharaohs as huge. So it's definitely... A lot different. When you see her from the front, she's mixing an eye, which is a little creepy. Uh, but one thing I wanted to point out is that oftentimes when people see um, Nefertiti, they see her as conventionally attractive in a sense that fits in with our time period. But I think what's important to understand is that that's a coincidence, um, partially maybe. Um, that we see her as beautiful, like 
her face is symmetrical and she has clear skin and every culture would see that as beautiful. But part of the reason why you might see her as very conventionally beautiful or looking like a fashion model or an actress um, is because it's the particular conventions of beauty um, happen to line up with some of the conventions of, that people see beautiful today, especially in the, the fashion industry. Uh, so you can kind of point some of those out. Like, why do you think she's beautiful? Uh, her eyebrows, <laughs> uh, which, you know, she didn't wake up like that. You know, it takes some work to get like that. Uh, she's wearing eye makeup, which makes her eyes larger. Uh, she has a low bridge to her nose uh, and then kind of a small nose, rather full lips. Um, a very precise line in her jawline and her cheekbones. And you can see how they kind of integrate her crown into these lines to emphasize those lines and a very long and slender neck. <clears throat> so I remember a few years ago when they used to have these uh, so-called Miss Universe contests. Uh, it was interesting to me because they would have people from all over the world, all different cultures, but the people who would win <clears throat> The people who would win the contest, the women that would win, they would all look basically like this. Um, and I thought that was very strange, but it just kind of shows how um, conventionalized beauty, which is coming mostly from um, the United States and France, had made its way all around the world. Uh, but interestingly, the Miss Universe contest recently uh, people have broken out of that and instead had local standards of beauty. So when you see it nowadays, you see people that look different. Not everyone has this exact same face shape um, and, and not even the same, same body shapes necessarily. Uh, so part of the reason why we might see is this is beautiful. These types of styles became popular. Um, this type of makeup style that she's wearing uh, and the kind of long neck and the chin that we see became popular in the 1920s. And it might have been actually influenced by this particular piece. It was found in the 19th century, but Egypt became very trendy. Uh, and in the 1920s and 30s, Max Factor basically developed this eyebrow um, shape uh, and makeup that made these cheekbones stick out and these full lips. Uh, and that became the look of Hollywood. And up and down through the years, it's kind of come to today. So that's part of the reason we, why we see it as beautiful. There are few to none other than symmetry universals in beauty. Um, you know, whether you're talking about like skin tone or proportions, um, those are different in different cultures. So that you see her as particularly beautiful is a cultural thing. Um, you would certainly see her as attractive at any time, but she fits into a convention that happens to fit into the conventions that are common today. Uh, so this is her mom, uh, Queen Tai. Uh, so Nefertiti and, Akhen and Akhenaten showed themselves as both having the same skin color, but again, it doesn't represent the real skin color. Uh, but same thing with Queen, Queen Tai, although um, half of her family was from Sudan, uh, and then the other half was from uh, Mitanni, which is is kind of around uh, what's called Kurdistan nowadays, uh, in around Iraq and Syria. Um, but the reason why her skin is shown dark like this because that was the convention for women at the time. Uh, so if you see women painted at this time, they always had dark skin. Um, but all of the people that you see probably look more like her <laughs> uh, than most of the other skin tones that we saw. Uh, I think she's kind of interesting because uh, her wig is kind of missing. There's, there's, there's kind of this mud part that's left over. Um, but her face um, is very similarly proportioned to Nefertiti. But people often see her as kind of mad as having, usually when I ask the cat class, they say it's the resting bitch face, uh, meaning uh, whenever you're relaxed, you're, you have down cor turn corners to your mouth. I think Kanye West also has the same problem. Um, I apparently do as well. Um, and <laughs> so maybe she's not mad, she's just relaxed, but some people see her as kind of intense. Uh, you know, who knows? Um, but she does have similar proportions. 
as her daughter. Uh, so the same kind of standards of beauty that we're seeing, you know, large eyes and the eyebrow shape, cheekbones and the chin and all of those things. Uh, what was kind of cool is this piece had been on display for a long time at the Museum of Berlin. And somebody found this piece in the back and they all of a sudden realized, hey, these two go together. So now when you see it displayed, uh, it shows, um, this is a symbol of Amun Ra, actually, not of the Aten. Uh, and they put these two together and this is how it's displayed. So uh, one of the downsides uh, to imperialists taking things out of countries is things that will get separated. And that's, that's what happened with this one. We'll talk about more about those types of ideas a little bit later on. So nowadays, um, since uh, World War I, uh, before World War I, Egypt was part of called, what's called the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and then it was occupied by um, the British. And um, after the war was over, the Egyptians said, Don't, no more stuff can leave the country. Um, so all of the stuff that was dug up after World War I, which ended in 1918, uh, that stayed in Egypt. And everything, if anything made its way out of Egypt, Egypt would like do whatever they can to, get, to recover the stuff back. Uh, and all of that stuff, including what was found in Tutankhamun's tomb is in the museum in Cairo. So this issue of people being able to own their own culture and its artifacts uh, and the effect of imperialism on that is gonna come up again, over and over again in this class. So we'll talk about it some more. So the reason that King Tut is so famous is because his tomb was discovered intact by Howard Carter. Almost all the tombs have been robbed, so Tuss was unique. This particular piece went right over his mummy uh, and then they had um, coffins and he was nested in three of them. Uh, and then they had the sarcophagi and he was nested in three of those. So he's well protected. Uh, Tutankhamun was extremely tiny. Uh, he only lived from the age of eight or nine to the age of 18 or 19. So it wasn't an important king at all. Uh, and in the beginning of his reign, um, he was shown in the same way that his father, and we know his, it's his father now, Akhenaten, because uh, of the DNA test. He was shown the same as his father, but by the end of his reign, the priest of Amun-Ra had taken over. They would changed his name from Tukat Aten to Tukat Amun, and that was the end of the, the Amarna period. So what we're seeing here, and I'm going to give you a video on the extra credit board so you can check it out. That uh, It's a brief one. It's like seven minutes long. It'll show you how mummies are made. It's really cool. Uh, so this is a canopic coffin. And what these are for are the various organs. Um, and regular people would have coffins that were done in animals that were the gods, that represented the gods of each organ. Uh, with the pharaoh, he just got all the same thing. It looks like one of his coffins. Uh, you can see he has the crook and the flail and all of the stuff. Um, so it was a long process, so I'll kind of show it in the video a little bit more. All the organs were removed except for the heart. They believe the soul was located in the heart. And the body was stuffed with aromatic oils such as cedar and wrapped with linen. And more important people were wrapped with more and finer linen. Oftentimes the king was wrapped with golden ox signs. Uh, when I taught, when I was a student, I took an Egyptian art class over at the University of Toledo. Uh, and our classes were located to the Toledo Museum of Art, which you're ever down there, I highly recommend. And at that time, the museum had their two mummies and their two coffins, and they were restoring the coffins. So I took the mummies that were normally displayed in a glass case, and they just put them on a gurney and pushed them to the back. Uh, and we got to go to a back room because we were taking this class at the time with the representative from the museum and see them, not under glass, uh, and on these gurneys right next to us, uh, you know, just a few feet away. Uh, and I mean, we could see them. If we wanted to, we could touch them, but we weren't going to because you don't want to do that. And we could smell them. And you're probably thinking, oh my God, that's so gross. Uh, but it wasn't gross at all because um, they're stuffed with aromatic oils and they're covered with these aromatic oils. They still smelled like cedar. They still smell good after all these years. Uh, I hope this smells so well in 3,000 years. Uh, and um, it was kind of amazing to see it. One of the mummies was partially unwrapped. It was kind of a fancier one. It was missing fingers. Uh, we had asked a representative of the museum what that was about, and she said that um, when these pieces were dug up, um, that they would cut off the fingers so that they could sell the jewelry separately because you can make more money that way. And indeed, that's what had happened. 
with the coffins they had. The coffins weren't actually associated with the mummies, uh, but when they had been dug up, um, people would just sell them to um, wealthy foreigners, like the Libbies who had started the museum in Toledo, and they would just sell them on the street. And you can understand why Egyptians would do that. Um, you know, money kind of means more, a little bit more in history. Uh, but as a result of that, a ton of stuff got taken out of Egypt. Uh, and some stuff was just taken even um, unwillingly, just people dug it up and Europeans thought it was theirs. Um, so I'll show you a video on how this works. Uh, and the idea is that uh, the organs have a lot of water in them, so they'd be kind of like dried out separately. Uh, and the only thing that would be put back in would be the heart. They didn't consider your soul to be located in your brain. So after the New Kingdom, various kingdoms had taken over um, ancient Egypt. Uh, one of them is the place that the ancient Egyptians called Kush. Uh, but the people of Kush, uh, who are modern-day Nubians, they considered themselves to be people of Kemet. And I'll kind of explain why that is. Uh, and when they took over, they were really fond of uh, the art of the Old Kingdom. And they had had a very powerful culture going back to that time. Uh, so they, the art that they make is kind of in the style of the Old Kingdom. So like sphinxes and they even made pyramids, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, so in about the 7th century BC, the Nubians invaded Egypt. Uh, they ruled as the pharaohs of the 25th dynasty. But again, they didn't consider themselves to be foreign. They didn't consider themselves people of Kush. They considered themselves people of Kemet. Uh, so they ruled from Memphis. Um, they looked at themselves um, as being descended from Amun-Ra, just like the um, pharaohs that we'd seen earlier. Uh, they also considered Gebel Barkal as a mountain of holiness in Nubia, pictured here. Uh, Kush honored Amun. They believed his true home was this sacred mountain. So they saw themselves as a people of Kemet, and they saw themselves as a united Egyptian dynasty during this time. Eventually, um, they were moved south um, after the fall of the 25th dynasty, and they still wanted to kind of get that sheen of the old kingdom, so they built some pyramids. Uh, these are reproductions in the front, and I'll tell you why those are there in a second, but they give me an idea of what they originally looked like. They basically mixed the old style of Egyptian pyramids with the new kingdom style. Of, these are called pylons that they would have in temples. Temples were like partially indoor and outdoors, and They'd be in levels, and these pylons would be between the levels. So you're seeing those in ruin. Uh, there's a re reason for that, a particularly awful reason, speaking of um, Europeans and imperialism. Um, so this Italian, Giuseppe Ferlini, uh, in the 1820s, he had heard about what some of the French and British had found, uh, like gold and all of these incredible things in Egypt that they were digging up. And uh, when he heard about these pyramids in Moreau, uh, which is modern day Sudan, he said, I know there's gotta be stuff in there. Nobody's, they look perfect. Nobody's gone in there before. Uh, so he tried to get a bunch of people together, get some investors um, to get a trip out there. Uh, he couldn't really find anybody, uh, but he did get um, enough money to be able to get out there. Uh, and when he got out there, he tried to, dig his way in, hack his way into them to try to find an inner chamber. Uh, by the way, there are no inner chambers. They were just solid. To try to find something, he wanted to have some gold or artifacts that he could be a millionaire from. Um, and he couldn't make his way in. Uh, so he was able to acquire some explosives and he just blew the things apart. Um, as you can see right here. Um, so literally this one person uh, and there was nobody there to stop them. Um, so that's kind of the effect of the French and British occupation of Egypt at this time. Uh, and all of these artifacts were ruined. So, so the ones that uh, people would remember what they look like, there had been um, drawings made of it. So they did these reproductions so you get an idea of what they originally looked like. Um, so Giuseppe Ferlini wasn't punished by any authority. Uh, again, that tells you the effect of imperialism. However, uh, he was bankrupted by the whole thing and he returned home uh, and ended up being, um, I guess I guess some of the people he borrowed from weren't so nice and 
Uh, they made his, the rest of his life, which was very short after this, very hard. Um, but that's why these things were destroyed. 